Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, as we continue looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mountain, we'll be looking at a few things in a quote that we have heard many times in the past, and maybe you've even quoted it before. But Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and, and uh, starting in verse number 38, the Bible says, Matthew 5, verse 38, And uh, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. How many have ever heard that phrase before? How many have ever used that phrase or heard somebody use that phrase? And we're going to look at that plus others and whosoever shall uh, care. And then uh, verse 39, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Well, that'd be difficult, isn't it? And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that seeketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, Turn not thou away. And as we've been looking at in the first part of verse 38 and verse 39, ye have heard, but I say unto you, if you have a habit of underlining, I, I pray you've underlined those phrase or marked them in your Bible. And uh, uh, ye have heard, but I say unto you, as, as with always, Jesus Christ is talking about the law, he's talking about the Old Testament and what has been handed down throughout the generations, what's been handed down throughout the Bible and the Word of God. He says, okay, you've heard all of this, but let me add to it. I'm not adding to the Word, but let me give you what the true definition is. I was, I was thinking of this uh, again last night as I was looking and going over this again. You know, you look at uh, the best uh, the best commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible. And uh, I thought about it again last night. I thought the Bible was explaining the Bible to the people who had read the Bible. He's the Word of God. The greatest commentary on the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Why? He is the Word. And he's saying, let me, uh, let me give you the interpretation. Let me give you the translation. Let me tell you, because what you're doing is you've twisted Scripture. But, you know, we have also done it with this passage of Scripture. And I want to try to explain what is Jesus Christ talking about. But what is this passage of Scripture? Most often the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is usually spoken out of anger. Something has happened, and you want to seek, uh, uh, you want to maybe right a wrong, you want to seek re, uh, recompense and saying, hey, you know what? I am going to uh, strike out at this person. You hit me, I'm going to punch you. You throw something at me, I'm going to toss it back at you. You slap me, I'm going to trip you and kick you when you're down. I am going to get, I'm going to get uh, avenge for this. I'm going to seek revenge. But what is talked about here? Now, those who seek to use this verse as a means to satisfy their vindictive spirit are not within the will of God. Now, Jesus lived in a society that had taken this commandment given in the law of God to justify the retribution unto others. Well, the Bible teaches it, and if it's in the Bible, then it's right. Now, that is true. If it is translated, if it is taken the way God has Intended. I believe that interpreted right, I should say. I believe that all in Scripture, all of Scripture has an intended interpretation. I believe there's some passages that aren't spoken to us, but yet we can pull uh, truths out of it. We can pull principles and apply to us as well. But it's easy to twist Scripture. 
and we can twist it to make it fit our needs. We twist it so it makes us feel good. What is being talked about here? Now, no doubt Jesus had witnessed the injustice of many who had suffered at the hands who sought to use God's word as a, uh, really as a premise for uh, seeking revenge. Well, God said I could do it, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Therefore, God said I could do it, I'm going to do it. He no doubt had seen the use of this passage of Scripture. Remember, he is not looking at us in the 21st century. Uh, he is speaking to those who are actively involved in the very things that he's being taught or that he is teaching, they are doing. But yet it's always happened all through Scripture here. So uh, there is something within, you know, human nature. Uh, it's our human nature to respond. Now, you know, if I were to look back here, and Caleb, you, you've got a sweet spirit, and Gabriel, and, and I walk up and just punch you in the mouth. Are you going to say, well, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. Praise the Lord. That was wonderful. I don't think that's going to be your response. Now, you might look a little shocked, and immediately your human nature wants to react. Not with praise God, but it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission, so I'm going to punch you back. That's human nature, is it not? You wrong me, I am going to seek revenge. You talk about me, I'm going to talk about you. You do me wrong, I'm going to make sure that I get my part in it. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus Christ is speaking to this. Now, as we'll discover, those attitudes and actions are contrary to the desires of God. Now, looking at this in verse 38, the Bible says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, the commandment of the law. Now, as with each of the previous thoughts, Jesus Christ says, Ye have heard, or it has been said, but I say unto you, this is what you've heard, but you've really changed the interpretation and you've perverted the word of God. But let me tell you what the Bible says. And he always adds to it. Again, Jesus Christ never took away from the commandments. He always added to it. He never took away from the word of God. He just gave more to it. The Bible says, to whom much is given... Much is what? Required. And so you look at this passage of Scripture. Now, as we look at this commandment a little bit closer, the context of the command. Now, as within previous verses, this too was not being considered in its proper context. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There can be no doubt that it was recorded in Scripture. Why? Because it's recorded in the Old Testament multiple uh, times and also in the New Testament. The Bible says in Exodus 21, 24, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. In, verse, in Leviticus 24, 20, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. Deuteronomy 19, 21, and thine eye shall not pity, but, the, uh, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So this commandment is mentioned in Scripture, giving, given the Lord, but it, is, it must be considered in its context. It's easy to take Scripture out of context. Each time that you find this listed or find this mentioned, it is talking about judicial law, not personal revenge. It is talking about the, the right of the judicial system in dealing with this. It was not given as reserved for individuals uh, to seek justice or to get justice for a wrongdoing. Now, those who administered the law 
could pass judgment in exact retribution. You take a person who has murdered. Now, I believe in capital punishment. I believe if a, now, not, and now let me say this. I'm not saying, as with anything, all police are bad, but there are some bad ones. There are some that have a thought and they build a case around it. But there's a lot of great officers. There's good judges, there's bad judges. Prosecutors, attorneys, and all that. I believe in capital punishment if it is true. If there is no evidence, no proof, they ought not be sitting in prison. But if a person has taken the life willfully and murdered somebody, that person's life ought to be taken. But you stand before a judge, you have been found guilty, a judge will give you his judgment or the penalty in accordance to the law. They have that right to. We talk about uh, what's going on in our country and, and things ought to be taken. I've heard Steve say several times, we have a judicial system. If it is done right and it is done rightly, then justice will be served. But a judge, inside of his uh, a perimeter, inside of the law, if they're within the law, has a right to hand out judgment that we do not have because we are not in that place of authority. So if you understand the context here of what Jesus is teaching here, he is not talking about seeking individual, but this is given to judicial law. It was given as a guideline to judges to hand out proper judgment. But you see, the corruption of the command, as in any case, any passage of Scripture taken out of context can be corrupted. And this is what has taken place. Jesus is dealing, of course, with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's teaching his disciples and those around. And, and these were some of the leaders of the, of the Jerusalem people or the, uh, of the Jews. And they were taking this passage of Scripture out of context. They had corrupted the law. Now, they were using their interpretation of this command. Now, what would be the reasoning for such corruption? Uh, I'm sure that it came about for reasons that even remain today. One is appeasement. Surely there were those that had genuinely suffered injustice at the, at the hands of others. You know, you take uh, uh, someone, I, I remember um, a man, they still, the family still goes to Pastor Judge Church and a drunk driver, he knew he was drunk, left the bar in the early, uh, early afternoon, he knew he was drunk, and so he normally takes the 196 or I-96, and he said, I'm going to take back roads because I know I'm drunk, but I need to get home. And he broadsided a, a close family friend, and, and their daughter was killed. Now, I know what the father wanted to do. He wanted to kill the man. How many of us would have blamed him? That thought, that feeling of wanting to seek revenge uh, for the death of his daughter. Especially given the fact, he said, he said, Brother Tad, he said, I sat there holding her as she was gasping for breath. And when I touched her chest, it was completely crushed. There's nothing I could do for her. And she gurgled and died in my hands. I so desperately want to kill him. I want him dead. Now, you can't blame him for that. But in accordance to the law and God's word... That is not given to him to do. There's no doubt injustice has been done to people. Maybe even yourself, you've been on the receiving end of injustice. And Christ is saying, yes, but this is still not you or, or the right for you to seek this type of justice. But for appeasement. 
You know, I'm sure that we can all relate to this. They suffered in the flesh, whether it be a physical or emotional, and, and they desire to be vindicated. You know, there's something within us that desires those who have wronged us to suffer for their wrongs. Our flesh takes satisfaction in seeing a wrong righted. Now, I'll talk about this here in a moment. What, what is the Bible saying here? You know, our flesh looks at this. Society views those that uh, refuse to uh, take a stand and, and to seek retribution as weak. But God's word says that we're to give it to him. Now, again, I am not saying that there are not times we need to stand. I don't want to jump ahead in, in, in this, in what he is saying. But, you know, the better man is the one who has the ability to walk away from confrontation. Someone wants a fight, and they want to fight you, and, and they want you to punch him back. How many of you have ever been in a confrontation when you so desperately just want to punch the person? Let's just be honest for a moment. None of you've ever been. I'm not talking about spouses, okay? I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking. I'm sorry. Uh, I just seen someone kind of give that slant out of the corner of their eye. But how, let's be honest. How many have ever you wanted to seek revenge? But do you realize if you act, they've won. They've won. If you not, I'm not saying you know stand there and. Okay, I'm not going to jump ahead. I, I, because, you know, it's hard to see, even in teaching this and looking at this, if someone, but we have to understand the context of what Jesus Christ is teaching here. But someone slaps you, it's pretty hard to turn the other cheek, isn't it? Because that's human nature. But what does God's word teach us? Again, the appeasement here. As long as we live in the body of flesh, that desire will remain. But as we'll discover in a moment, it is not pleasing to God. The judicial system has the right and authority to exact judgment, but God's people should not seek revenge. Approval, not only appeasement, but approval. Now, as we consider the context of the passage, we know that Jesus was speaking to those that had authority over the common people. They were looking for leadership, and they were corrupting the scriptures here. There were those who exacted judgment because they knew that it is what society wanted. Well, this is what they want, so this is what I'm going to give them. Whether God's word or the law allows it or not, that's what they want. Well, it doesn't matter what the people want. What does the law say? It doesn't matter what the people want. What does God's word teach? Everything we do is based upon the word of God. Let me ask you a simple question. How many of you live in a free nation? How many live in a free nation? We do not live in a free nation. We live in a nation guided by rules of law. As long as you stay within the rules, you're all right. But if you think you have the freedom to step outside of the law, you are going to be punished. It's the same thing in God's Word. That's what's uh, talked about in Jude, uh, is the license to sin. Because we're Christians and, and because we're saved, we have a license to sin. Because it's all we have to do is go to Christ and say, hey, I'm sorry for doing that. I'm forgiven and everything's okay. But that's, that's not God's word. And so he is teaching these people. It doesn't matter what the people want. The Jewish leadership were condoning the injustices to please the people. You know, we're seeing that in abundance in our day to day. Many have no concern for what the Word of God teaches. Many pastors, many leaders, they don't care what God's Word teaches. This is what the people want. This is what they desire. So I'm going to give them what they desire. 
Listen, people, we don't need to give people what they want. We need to give people what they need. You take medicine. Um, this week, uh, Addie had to take medicine twice a day. She did not like it. Her Grammy said, can you help me give this to her? I'm like, I don't want to be the bad person. I'm going to wash my hands. Go ahead. I want her to at least love one of us, you know. And you started to put it in the side of her mouth, and she hated it. So it's what we did is we just listened to what she said, and, and, and she doesn't want it. I'm not going to give it to her. Now, how many would say that's foolish? You need to give them, when a child is sick, a person is sick, you give them what will help them. Natural remedy, uh, whatever it might take, you give it to them. So she didn't like it. We gave it to her. It helped her. God's word says it doesn't matter what a person wants. What does a person need? But they were given what the people want. Why? For approval. It's kind of like politics. I'll, I'll tell you what you want to hear, but I'm going to live completely differently than that. We need honesty. I, I liked the, uh, I forget what uh, um, state it was, the concession speech of Tim someone I believe it was and, and he said he's a Democrat lost to a Republican and he says I'm going to concede gracefully a paraphrase in there he said because this is what we do in America you lose the election you concede and you stand behind the one that won how many of you saw that speech anyone see it there's a great I mean it just sharp he said a lot of people are upset that I lost I lost but in America, when you lose, you concede. And, and he had lost, not by a huge number, and, and it was a very good speech. He was a, he's a good man. But what does God's Word teach us? It doesn't matter what people want. What is God's Word? You know, again, it doesn't matter what the world approves of or how many are engaged in a particular act. While the majority rules... God's Word ought to define everything we do. God's Word ought to. Listen, I don't care what the law says in these proposals. Murder is murder. Someone brought out a pretty interesting fact. I, um, I, tried. I have the link copied. And uh, the term used for Jesus Christ as a, as a fetus inside of the womb and outside of the womb, he is referred to as the exact same thing. And he brought out a tremendous uh, uh, point how you cannot be pro-choice and pro-abortion given what God's Word teaches, Jesus Christ was a, was a fetus inside of the uterus and came out of the uterus and was a baby. You remember when Mary got close to Elizabeth? What happened to John the Baptist? Bible says that he leaped within. And it's the same term that's used. It's outside. You see, it doesn't matter what the, what the fetus is inside of the uterus. It's the same thing when it's outside. You see, I don't care what the law says. I know what God's Word teaches. Everything we do ought to define us. It doesn't matter what the world says. Now, the clarification of the law. But I say unto you, they resist not evil. Now, Jesus adds to that which they have heard and hold dear. Now, I want to mention a couple of things about this statement. The application. Jesus is speaking against personal retribution or vindictiveness. He's saying you don't need to be vindictive towards someone. You don't need to seek retribution. He is urging them to avoid confrontation and resist the urge to seek personal uh, uh, retribution again. Now, uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king or supreme, 
or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. You see, the Bible is clear in regard to the authority of human government and our obligation to abide by the law. Now, again, if it is in complete um, contradiction to God's word, we are not to abide by that law. You could pull out on the road. What is the speed limit on M40? <laughs> now what you like to. Now that 70 is when you get to the speed lane up there by one. Now that's, that's the speed lane, not passing lane. How many of you have ever followed someone? I know that, but this is biblical. You want to seek, this verse sometimes just hits too close to home. An eye for an eye, bumper for a bumper, um, a wave for a wave. You, they're 50 miles an hour until they hit the speed lane. And you start to pass them, they're like, oh, hey, I'm doing 50. And they push the gas, and you're trying to pass them, and they push the gas, and so you let them go because they realize their error. You know, some of us actually want to break the law. They are doing it to keep us behind, and as soon as they get back to the single lane, it's 50 mile an hour again. You're like, Lord, save them from something. But the law says 55, and if you do 70, and an officer pulls you over, did you break the law? Is there anything wrong with the law being 55? That's what the speed limit is. We abide by the speed limit. How many of you like those signs that says no passing? You're going up a hill. You can't see what's on the other side, but I think I'm going to pass that person. The reason it's there is so you don't put someone else's life in danger. Those are laws that we should abide by. A transgender membership at our church, not at all. A homosexual pastor, not at all. Those are things we cannot stand behind. Why? It's in direct violation of God's word. It's not gay, it's sodomite, I should say. Gay marriage, lesbians, no, it's sodomites. That's what the Bible calls it. Let's just call it what it is. Now, I'm not being mean. Let me say this. If a couple like that were to walk in the back door and they were to sit in the service to hear preaching, I'm not going to kick them out. I hope that the Word of God will change their life. Now, I won't let them have involvement. Now, uh, in that, now, if they're coming, most of the time, though, the, the, these couples and these uh, people that come into a church service, it's not to hear the preaching of God's Word. It's to disrupt the service. We are to love people, but not accept the sin. And so he's saying here that the clarification, the application here is we are to submit. Again, you look at what is being taught here. The Bible says in Romans 12, uh, verse 17 and 19. Turn your Bibles there for just a moment. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now again, if we are God's children and we are saved, God is going to take care of us. God will deal with those people. God will take care of that matter. If you look at verse 18, the Christian is not to seek an eye for an eye. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you look at the application, but the confusion here. Now, there's much confusion that has risen from this verse. 
In regard to refusing to resist evil, Jesus is teaching that we should resist the urge to seek retribution for those who have done evil to us. Now, once again, we must keep this in its proper context. If we took that verse out of context and and caused it to stand alone, one would interpret the passage of Jesus in Scripture that he is speaking, uh, the refusal to confront any type of evil or sin. That is not what Christ is saying here. Clearly, when you consider the complete teachings of Scripture, we are to stand against evil. We are to stand against sin. You look at James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 9, Whom resisteth steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Listen, If God's people, as God's people, we have an obligation to stand for truth and stand against evil doing. Again, we need to make sure that that we stand against that which is evil. I don't care if the law says it's, it's legal. You could throw me in prison. I will never, ever, ever uh, do a, a marriage ceremony between the same genders. Never. It'll never happen in this church. Never happen outside of this church. I won't say, you know, listen, I understand, doctor, why you have to do what you have. You're you're held in accordance to your license as a doctor. You have to perform abortions because that's what your uh, place of employment requires you. No, if you're a Christian or even if you're not a Christian, quit the job then. We will not stand for that. We won't stand for murder. We won't stand for abuse. Now, we look at those things, but listen, I'm against child abuse. I'm against spousal abuse. I'm against any type of those things. I'm sorry, young people. A spanking is not abuse. It's, it's just a different form of education, hopefully teach you not to do it again. But our kids, no one ever gets in trouble at our church. We have, we have perfect kids. Some of them are like, man, I so desperately want to agree with you, but my dad and mom's looking at me, and I just probably better not. Now, when you look at sin, Christ isn't saying that we are not to stand against wrong. It, 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 my father told me, he said, let me tell you something. When I was starting high school, even junior high, he said, listen, if you start a fight... When you get home, I'm going to whip your tail. He said, now, if you are getting hit and punched and beat up and you, and, and you just say, give it to me, so I'm going to beat you up when you get home too. If someone came up and started punching, I'm going to defend myself. We'll look at uh, turn the other cheek in just a moment. What was Christ talking about here? He's, Christ isn't saying don't defend yourself but you definitely don't go out and try to look for a fight. You don't definitely, you definitely don't go out and, and, and try to seek a trouble here. Now, the correlation of life. Now, how does he talk about this? In, in verse 39 through 42, what is he saying? Here we find Jesus goes and he gives us several illustrations as to how we're to act as Christians, but also things that were happening at that moment in time. Consider relating to retaliation. Again, now, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, the Lord teaches us to turn the other cheek when we have been struck unjustly. Now, he is dealing with personal insult or how we are expected to respond. How many have ever been slapped in the face? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying your mama did it because you back talked. That's, I mean, we're not talking about that. Uh, you know, you take, and we've said this before, um, rubber man, a rubber woman. Ain't it amazing, young people, how... how, how how much your parents' arms will stretch. 
I mean, they can reach five people and grab your ear and jerk it. In that look, you know what it means. When we get home, we're going to talk. That doesn't mean you're... I won't be talking. You might be. I'll just be listening. We, that look there. But, you know, that the, the slap in the face. What is he saying here? Now, among the Jews, a slap in the face uh, was probably one of the most degrading acts of the, that someone could commit towards you. Something that someone could do to you. And he's saying, you know, uh, turn the other cheek then. Now, again, I know that that would be hard to do. But we need to understand that it involves much more than an outward reaction. This is dealing with an attitude of the heart. If someone is coming against you and, and, and fighting, what are we to do? We're to, are we to defend ourselves? Yes. But are we trying to hurt them desperately? Humanly speaking or biblically speaking? The Christian is expected to avoid confrontation. Now, let me say this. I never had a fight in junior high nor high school. Came close. But I always talked about what, what, what would be the purpose? What did I do to you? Well, I heard that you thought this. It's usually some moron that his elevator doesn't even get off the bottom floor. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought it came out. That's not exactly. Yeah, I mean, someone who's greatly intellectually challenged. You know, many times confrontation starts in a wrong way because of words. The Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. What are we to do? Use the Word of God. Use the Bible. But also try not to be in a place or put yourself in a situation where you're going to find uh, confrontation in that way. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about uh, a realm where you're dealing with people and you have to deal with people, but many times bad things happen when you're in the wrong places. Uh, take this. I was on, on um, Wednesday night, a week ago Wednesday. Of course, I'd went in on Saturday, had emergency surgery for uh, my lovely kidney stones. Uh, Wednesday night, that Wednesday night, we had to go back in the hospital, and uh, the pain was so severe, and, and we were there, and all of a sudden, out in the hallway, at 1 o'clock in the morning, out in the hallway, all of a sudden, you could hear doctors and nurses screaming and hollering, and they're hollering, get the, uh, get the uh, um, um, surgeons here, and, and, and uh, we need surgeons, and, and we need trauma unit here, we need CAT scans, we need this, and and so after an hour at the hospital, finally they came in and gave me some medicine. And I said to the nurse, I said, and we could hear the talk out there. A young person had been shot. We thought it was a young girl had been shot with one of the nurses outside the door uh, talking. My, my wife was talking to me. I'm like, shh, <laughs> what? I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to eavesdrop on what's going on. Something big's taking place out there. Hence, I'm not getting my medicine, so I might as well enjoy something here. And, and so we're listening, and, and a nurse came in, and I said, sounds like it's been a uh, good day. And, and she said, well, uh, a 16-year-old, or she said a young person. I said 16 because I heard the date of his birthday, and, or her birthday. And she said, no, actually, it was a boy. She said a group of 16-year-olds, and then I read it in the paper, met up with another 16-year-old, there was a confrontation, a gun was pulled, and one was shot in the abdomen. My first thought was, what in the world are 16-year-olds doing on a school day at 1 o'clock in the morning out walking around? Where in the world is mom and dad? You, nothing good happens after 10, 11 o'clock at night out running around the streets. That's foolish of what had taken place. You say, well, that person was innocent. 
They weren't innocent. They should have been home. And so what I'm saying here is that relating to retaliation, he rebuked the officer. Remember, remember Jesus Christ. He's, he's saying, uh, take the high road uh, when it comes to situations like this. Jesus Christ rebuked the officer who struck him during the mock trial, but he did not retaliate to them. He could have, but he did not. Consider the agony that he endured during this time. Relating to litigation, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now it seems as if a slap in the face would be easier to endure than this, but yet again Jesus reveals how we are to respond. It appears that those in authority would have ruled against the one of whom Jesus spoke and demanded that he offer the coat as a means to payment. He was speaking to this. Now, the coat speaks of a tunic or an undergarment that is, is close to the, the skin. He reveals that, listen, if they're going to take your coat, offer the tunic as well. Now, that's not uh, the, the whole. It's the upper portion of clothing. He said, listen, if he takes your coat, give him this too. This speaks of integrity. It speaks of uh, to, to reveal one's intent to bring reconciliation to this dispute. It, is, it has the idea to do whatever necessary to make things right. Go above and beyond to do that which is right. It reveals that there's no bitterness, no ill will against those whom we've had a dispute. Relating to cooperation, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Now, in general sense, we all understand this phrase, go the extra mile. But we have to understand the context as to what Jesus Christ is teaching here. You see, under Roman law, the law gave a soldier the right to force a civilian to carry his, his backpack, his sword, his weapons. He had the right under the law to say, I'm a Roman soldier. Abraham, you're going to take all of my weaponry, my bag, whatever I have, and you're going to carry it a mile. There's nothing you could do about it because it's under the law. And so what is Jesus Christ teaching here with this? Now, a Roman mile was slightly shorter than our mile. The law designed to relieve the soldier only caused an inconvenience to the civilians, especially that those that are oppressing you, seriously, I hate you already, and now I have to carry your equipment? Boy, talk about insult to injury. And he's saying it's still dealing with the heart. Don't just carry it one, carry it two. The attitude of the heart here. He is speaking of being asked or even forced to do something we really don't want to do. I believe that we've probably all been in that situation. It may have been a legitimate need or it may have been an inconvenience. But it's what he's saying. If someone has a need... Try to fulfill that need. Be willing to go the extra mile regardless of the inconvenience. Many today seem to resent having to do anything that is expected of them. The Bible says that our heart ought to be right. We ought to do what is right. When you see someone in need, try to meet that need for them. In verse 42, give to him that asketh thee and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now it's easy to consider this verse and miss the real meaning here. Man, if someone has a need, I'd be more than happy. You know, I look around the church and, and if you need something and I have it, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to try to help you with that need or allow you to use it if I have it. 
how many would agree? You look around the church, you see your friends, you see your uh, ones that you do things with. You say, hey, if you need it, not a problem. But Jesus isn't talking about those people. He's talking about the people that's done you wrong. You see, I don't mind helping out my friends and my church members. But those that have slandered me, those that have talked about me, those that have sought ill will, well, bless God, they can just go their own way. In fact, I think it's kind of funny that they're hurting. And Christ is saying, no, that's wrong. We're not to do good to just those that are good to us. We're to do right to all people. He says if they have a need. You know, he has been dealing with those with whom there's been confrontation. This is difficult to accept many times, but Jesus is teaching that we are to give liberally to those who have wronged us in the past. Regardless of past deeds, actions, or feelings, we're not to turn them away. We're to try to help them. How many of you have ever had someone do you wrong, and later on they asked you for help in some matter? The Bible says help them. Why? We might be able to win them. Might be able to change their heart. To put it in layman's terms, we are to have the attitude that, that we should never have the attitude that it serves you right, but this is what God would have me to do. Folks, we are to put a past feelings behind us. You know that bitterness always burns the bridge to forgiveness. I've mentioned that before. We, if someone has hurt us, we need to give it to God. Why? It relieves us of the burden. Say, God, this is yours. You deal with it. Again, trying to preach and teach us in a way that God would have us. We are to put a past behind us and be willing to give Christian love to those in need. You know, sometimes when we do this, it's a little bit of humble pie to them. But what does God's word teach? You know, when you look at these verses and you deal with the issues that we have, and all of us have faced these at some point in time. It's easy to allow bitterness to enter our hearts. But the Bible says, cast blessings upon them. Go the extra mile. Help them out. If they have a need, give to them. Now, I'm not saying someone who has no need that, that is just looking to use you or, 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 or uh, uh, trying to abuse a situation, but there are some people out there that truly, that we come across that could usually, truly use help. I'm not even saying financial, but just an encouraging word, maybe. Maybe a friendly ear. This is what God would have us do. You know, the flesh desires to get even, but the Lord desires that we repent and represent his holiness. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. I pray that you would be with us here this day. Lord, help us, and in each of us, myself included, that our first thought and act is not seeking revenge, but Lord, what would you have us do? Or Lord, would you take care of this situation? Lord, would you deal with this? Lord, I pray that you'll help us to, to be the type of Christians we ought to be and, and that we are a true representation of what Christ's likeness ought to be. I know I could never come close to that. But Lord, everything I do and say ought to represent you. We fail each and every day, but Lord, help us to do what is right. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning has never come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Maybe you've never said, Lord, come into my heart and save me. But you'd like to. I pray you don't leave here today without knowing. Maybe someone here has been hurt and you're trying to figure out how do I deal with this. Lord, I pray you give them wisdom. And if someone's been hurt, I pray that 
you allow that hurt to pass and that they can get the victory but also make amends with those people. Lord, I don't know of any situations, but each and every time we come across a person or a situation, let us react in a way that is honoring to you, Lord. Be with us this day. We love you. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Grab your psalm books. Turn to 289. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Page 281. I'm sorry.